First off, as uh, I've said a million times, the world is changing. The idea that uh, we can uh, any longer get by primarily pointing to the problem and say, oh, there's a problem, give us money, or talk about how busy we are or how much we care, and expecting the investor community to uh, continue to support us, um, is, it, it's a fallacy. It's changed. The world has changed. The, the outcomes movement, um, at least in the States, started 20 years ago. Uh, it's spreading around the world. I don't think very many organizations are going to be immune. So answer number one is because this is what the investor community is moving towards requiring. Number two, um, the second benefit is, and it's, it's connected to number one, those organizations that can do this, that can speak this language, will have a better chance of surviving uh, than organizations that can't. Uh, there's, there are several examples in history we could point to where a language officially changed. Those people that learned the language, the new language, were able to prosper. Those who couldn't and stuck to the old language, sooner or later, uh, were either marginalized or in some other way made uh, uh, inconsequential. So the truth of the matter is that if you are an organization that is uh, po poorly resourced, under-resourced, or marginally resourced, that's going to get worse because the organizations that are well resourced or are ahead of the curve and are early adapters, they are going to gain an advantage. An advantage. And we're already seeing this in the United States. Uh, where there's already a cadre of big boys that are sucking up most of the resources. In the United States, approximately 94% uh, uh, of the money in the nonprofit space goes to only about 6% of the nonprofits. That gap is going to get bigger. So it is incumbent upon uh, these organizations to, to learn the language. The last thing is that our sector, irrespective of whether you're talking the UK, Canada, US, Australia, it's full of well-meaning people by and large. Virtually everyone truly wants to do a better job. But this is an opportunity to understand whether in fact you are doing the job that you said you were doing. And if not, how to change what you're doing, change the description of what you think you're doing, and get to the point where you actually are having a, 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 a beneficial impact on those you exist to serve. I think number one is getting the heads around the concept. Um, we have in the, uh, in the English speaking world, we have a tradition of going back at least to the 1840s uh, and possibly earlier than that, of focusing on the problem and pointing to the problem as the justification for our existence and for the justification for the support that we seek. Um, we also have at least, at this point, this is 2014, we have at least a 40 year, 45 year history of looking at activity and uh, assuming that it's, that it's a proxy for some sort of impact. It isn't. Activity is a proxy for merely activity. You know, you fund activity, activity is usually all you're going to get. So, it, I think the biggest problem for most organizations is to divorce themselves from the traditional thinking and move to this new kind of thinking. That the accent is no longer just on making services available, it's on change. What kind of change? Uh, that, the, uh, that activity no longer suffices. And the biggest one is to stop thinking about the sources of our support as funders. They are not funders. This is not manna from heaven. This is an investment. They are investors and as investors they are due a return. A lot of people in our sector don't like that, ter that terminology because they associate it with Wall Street. It has nothing to do with Wall Street. It has to do with the fact that this money is given to us in trust. It is somebody showing faith in, in our vision of a better situation, whatever the space we're working in. This is not a gift. The root of the word donate is Latin for gift and give. It's the wrong word. The word funder implies, number one, no reciprocity. Number two, implies that the source has no interest in what's done with it. Those are all wrong. These are investors, and we have to start thinking of them as investors. These are the biggest challenges. Training. I mean, it's, it, it, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen by magic. It can't happen by executive fiat. The executive director or the president can't just say, from now on, think differently. And, and, and I mean, that, that just doesn't happen. People need to be taught 
and we need to make investments in the training, not only in what's the thinking, but also what is the application. And I don't know about Australia, but I can tell you that this is one of the big, giant gaps in the States. More and more, the investor community is requir requesting outcomes, requiring outcomes, demanding outcomes, but they are virtu supplying virtually no resources to allow people to understand what this means, to understand what it means for them to implement it, or to be able to actually do it and use it. So there's a lot of floundering around. This has to be something seminal that an organization, a uh, 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 nonprofit entity uh, that's doing certain work, has to really start with the most basic things. Number one, it's all fine and good to have a mission statement on the wall and a vision statement on the wall, but where the rubber re meets the road, where the Im implementation is taking place, it's very, very important to make certain that the most basic questions are answered, and one of those questions is, in fact, um, do our outcomes lead to uh, the realization of what we've written in the mission statement and the vision statement. So, uh, and I don't believe that any, any program is basic enough that it should, be escape, that should, es it should escape this. Um, another thing is that this outcomes business, this outcomes approach, it's not about reporting. It's not about measuring. It's about doing better and learning. Within that context, um, it is also not merely about the programs. There are ways to apply an outcomes uh, basis to your hiring. There are ways to, appro to apply an outcomes basis to your communications. Uh, there are ways to approach outcomes uh, or apply outcomes to a variety of things. I use the example of General Electric, for example. General Electric is a company that's adopted Six Sigma which is the single most powerful outcomes management uh, system in the world. There's virtually nothing you can do at GE anymore that you shouldn't do according to them, uh, according to Six Sigma principles. I don't care whether you're ordering paper clips. They want to see it done according to Six Sigma principles. That is true infiltration. That's the kind of thing we need to do here. Outcomes are not just about measuring. It's not just about reporting. It's about doing things differently, but doing every, ultimately doing everything differently. Why would you want to do your programs based upon an outcomes basis, but still do your hiring and your, your, your annual reviews of people on an activity basis? Once you learn how to do this, you can do it with anything. Okay, those are three different things. Um, strategic plan um, is uh, quite different, I believe, than uh, mission and vision. Strategic plan generally focuses on where does the organization want to be after a certain period of time, three years, five years. Uh, in, the, in the corporate world, it has to do with such things as market share. It has to do with such things as positioning in the field. Um, I don't think that this is vastly different in the nonprofit in the nonprofit space. I have not worked with an awful lot of nonprofits on strate strategic plans because that's not what I do. But what I know of them has to do with uh, where do we want to be positioned as an organization in three years? Uh, most of them will say a piece of it will have to do with uh, our fiscal situation. Are we financially sound? Do we have more money? Have we uh, diversified our funding sources? These are, this is usually part of a strategic plan. Where do we want to be positioned in the marketplace, in the community? And again, this is the, a lot of nonprofits don't think of themselves as being in the marketplace, but they are. And first and foremost, the physical geographic community in which they operate is their market. Um, if people don't generally know about you, it's hard for them to support you. If people don't know what you're doing, it's hard for them to support what you're doing. It's not enough for you to be known merely to your traditional investors. It's particularly dangerous if your traditional investor maybe is government. What if a new party comes in? What if there's a new executive that says, gee, we're not, you know, that's not as important as it was anymore. You need to be able to uh, call upon, rely upon uh, um, support. You've, called, you've used the word stakeholders. The thing that, and again, remember, I work with a vast, vast array of nonprofits. They're not all in human services. Some are in community development. Some are in housing. Some are in historical preservation, a particular love of mine. Some are cultural organizations. Some are you know, the local orchestra, the local uh, public radio station. 
a big problem that non-profit entities have in the United States anyway is they're most often known best by those who are their, their, their income sources, not by the rest of their constituents, not by the rest of the community. They have to get known by them. And so I think that in terms of getting to a, you know, tying this into a strategic plan, this is how you realize the benefits of a strategic plan, I feel, by utilizing an outcomes approach.